It's just after I see a movie, I like to go get a piece of pie and talk about it. It's sort of a little tradition I have. Do you like to get pie after you see a good movie? Hey, everybody. Welcome back to A Piece of Pie, the queer film podcast. I'm your host, Brian Rowe, and I am here with my good friend and contributor, Joe. Hello there. Hi there. I'm so excited for this episode. Um, A few weeks ago, in in, in a recent episode, Max and I were talking Magnolia, and Max and I were talking about how our friendship really started with bonding over Magnolia. And I feel like that's true with you and I with Scream. (laughs) Um, So I'm excited. I'm excited to have you on to talk about this. Um, I think Scream and Buffy were like our two big. uh, Absolutely. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) those are the big ones for sure. Um, And so thank you for agreeing to come on. Uh, I know you were on for Showgirls. Welcome back. Um, It's a pleasure to be back. Thank you. As ever, as I did with Showgirls, you know, I uh, in covering when deciding what to cover, I'm like, okay, I know people who are experts in this. And for Scream, uh, I wanted to get you along. So again, thanks thanks again. Uh, but yeah, we're talking the Scream movies. It's its 25th anniversary this year. Um, and we're just gonna talk all four films and we're gonna be talking about them. We usually do like, we're talking about one movie and then another, but since it's four, we're, I think we're gonna kind of just talk in general, over all of them, and of course, and of course, the Scream series needs no introduction. It debuted with Scream One in 1996. Um, it's now 25 years later. There's been four. Scream Five is coming out in January. If you're listening to this post Scream Five, uh, welcome. <laughs> yeah, we'll just start right off the bat with Scream, the uh, sort of quintessential 90s horror film. Um, but before we really dig into it, I really wanted to kind of sort of tell. Uh, my story of Scream and how I came to be so obsessed with it. Um, And if you have one, Joe, you're welcome to share. But mine is simply, (laughs) I was a Friends fan when uh, it was on. I was watching, and I watched a lot of Entertainment Tonight at the time, and they did a behind the scenes of uh, Scream. Although at the time it was called Scary Movie, and it was starring Nev Campbell and Courtney Cox and her big, you know, post-Friends film debut um, and one of the actresses, or I'm sorry, one of the reporters for Entertainment Tonight was actually an actress in the movie. Her name is Lisa Canning. She has, she's the reporter from one who's uh, holding up the mask and then I'm standing in front of the buses. Uh, she was shooting, she used to work for Entertainment Tonight. So I remember I was excited about it. And then the movie came out. And of course I read Entertainment Weekly and things uh, at the time and they were talking about it. And they got like, it got like an A, an EW. And I was really excited. And then it didn't come to the movie theater by my place. Uh, it was limited release when it first came out. Um, and I had to beg my parents to take me to see it because it was <laughs> the Courtney Cox like horror movie. And also it was supposed to be really good and really funny. And I just was excited and I wanted to see it. And so they drove over to another part of town um, over the bridge where there were different other movie theaters where it was playing. They went Christmas shopping And I went to see Scream. And I was one of like maybe 15 people in the theater. Um, And I remember I left the movie and I loved it. And I told people at school and nobody had heard of it. Like nobody knew what I was talking about. Um, And then by the time I came back from Christmas break, uh, it had sort of blown up. And now everybody was talking about it. Um, And I was like, no, well, I was there first. (laughs) I was there opening weekend. I made my parents take me. Um, I've loved it ever since. It's been... uh, a long wild ride uh 25 years it's crazy um, 25 years it's know. amazing i know and it's you know I, I i could not have predicted that <laughs> um it's 25 years ago when i was i didn't even have a driver's license you know uh i had to beg my parents to take me across town to the movie theater that was further away um i'm surprised they did it i must have gotten good grades that, that year <laughs> of course we all know the story nev campbell plays sydney prescott she uh is stalked by what turns out to be um, her classmates um, who are obsessed with scary movies. And I don't know, it goes from there. I feel like I'm kind of rambling uh, and not really saying anything. But uh, yeah, I love this movie. Of course, it starts off with uh, Drew Barrymore in that classic iconic scene. Oh my God, I- yeah. It really never gets old. I've, I've watched the original Scream I mean, just dozens of times easily. Uh, and really that scene just, it gets me every time. Very similar uh, 
to Sarah Michelle Gellar trying to get away in I Know What You Did Last Summer, uh, that opening scene with Drew, you really, there's always a moment where I think she's going to be able to yell out to her parents and live and it never happens. And that's what makes it both heartbreaking and so satisfying every time because it's such a good opening kill and it really sets the tone for just what comes next that had not been really done in the horror genre ever. Yeah, I um, rewatching it for this, I kind of tried to, uh, it was difficult. I've seen it dozens of times as well, um, but it was dif- so it was difficult to do, but I made really made an effort to kind of forget everything I know about it. And I was trying to like watch it fresh. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things that I did notice, I had a, actually a couple of things that I noticed that I wanted to talk about just from that opening scene. Number one, when it opens and she's talking to him on the phone and you don't know, it's like, you, you could put this in and like, it's, they're like, it's weirdly flirty and it, but like in a way that works, like you can kind of sense her kind of like lowering her defenses or whatever. And they're kind of flirting at first because he's like, um, it goes right up until the moment he's like, well, I want to know who I'm looking at. Like right up until that, it's very flirty and, and kind of cute and funny. Um, of course, it's, a, it all ends up being really terrifying later, but. Um, it's, I thought it was really effective and then the other thing I was thinking about watching it this time honestly was just how they these two characters uh, oh by the way we're talking spo- full spoilers so if you haven't seen these movies then go back and watch them um, but watching it watching rewatching it the first time these two characters Billy and Stu are there's no no real reason for them to be wearing ghost the ghost face mask like that is purely for the audience the the movies movies audience um which i thought was interesting because it uh they throughout their their whole plan just seems to be recreating their favorite scary movies and so it makes sense that with that in mind they're like oh and we're gonna get this weird mask um but it really feels like it just in terms of the scene it feels more for the audience because they go to school with them so they could have easily have just like walked into her house (laughs) and you know Mm -hmm. just killed her that way but they make it into this this game um and that's what i think kind of i mean that's what makes the movie that's its whole thing it's like like i was like i said it was originally called scary movie it it was a originally a sort of a spoof of these of horror films of the 80s and late 80s and early 90s well, more of a send up, I guess I would say. Yeah, send up is better. Oh, and that Gail is introduced in neon green. <laughs> the first time we see her, she is wearing neon green. She um, sure is. Um, and and it's interesting. Is feathered to death. Yes. Uh, well, it was funny that I mentioned that we our 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 fan diagram and our friendship was Buffy and Scream because that was. One of the notes that I wrote down too was in both of them, they re-examine the final girl. They are both sort of, uh, well, uh, Buffy more explicitly, I feel like, like mm-hmm. Joss Whedon specifically set out to like turn that on its head. Whereas this, it was sort of part of the, it's part of the send up. It, she, it makes her a, a final girl was part of the send up of, of what they're sending up. Um, but no, like I said, though, Scream, the original Scream, it's an all-time classic. It's now 25 years old. Um, I have to say I'm a little bit uh, proud of myself that I made my parents go and take me to see this movie. Because uh, what a gift it's been. <laughs> it really is the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, every every 10 years or so, they're going to do another one. <laughs> um, and I thought for sure that when Wes Craven died, that was that. But uh, yeah. I mean, that's something that this new Scream, this 25 years later Scream, not Scream 5, they want us to yeah. believe. Um, that's something that I think already, I, I'm going to give it a fair a fair chance, certainly, but it's something that really, it's got the deck stacked a little bit against it for not having Kevin Williamson as a writer and... Wes Craven as a director. Yeah. Um, I had actually forgotten while rewatching all of these that Scream 4 had both of them. 
Um, so the fact that you get one through four with this very consistent behind the scenes team. Um, and now I think Scream 5 is written by like six different people and directed by probably a few as well. So <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> Yeah, the fifth one is directed by a directing team. I don't have uh, that in front of me, but it's two guys. Yeah. Uh, they directed Ready or Not. And I did really enjoy Ready or Not. So yeah. that's that's in the plus column. But yeah, I, I, and what I'm saying is it's really kind of strange that uh, we'd be going all in on another Scream movie without, you know, without yeah. those two. The double whammy of Kevin Williamson and Wes Craven. May he yeah. rest. Yeah. Well, Kevin Williamson did not write Scream 3. He only has a story credit and it was written by Aaron Kruger. Oh, that's right. I forgot about Aaron Kruger. Uh, yeah. Which I will get to that. When we talk, we get to talking about the movies, but I think that's one of the reasons that for me, 3 doesn't work as much because, and we've had this discussion a million times, uh, but now we're having it recorded. So <laughs> we can just refer back to it. Uh, it. It's more of a comedy than the uh, previous two it's more of a send up um, right down to, I mean, one of the worst moments in the history of this franchise to my mind is the Jay and Simon Bob cameo. Um, <laughs> Connie fucking just, Chung, are you kidding? I hate it. I hate it so much. I hated it from the minute I learned it was the thing. <laughs> Why? I just, I'm not a big Kevin Smith fan. Number one. Well, I mean, I could take them or leave them. Honestly, I just thought it was. I mean, that whole movie is just literally looking right into the camera and winking, the whole movie. <laughs> so yeah. it did not feel out of place to me at all to see them because their whole thing is sending up movies. It actually yeah. felt very appropriate that we would see them. Thank God it was just a cameo, for <laughs> sure. I don't need to see like what they were going to do in Act Three or anything, but. Yeah, I thought imagine? it worked well within the context of Scream Three, which is its own very special context. <laughs> it's its own unique context for <laughs> sure. Um, I think that you and I both do both agree, though, that it's, it's Scream Two is where it's at. Like Scream is it's a, it's obviously its own iconic movie on in its own right, but I think, uh, and it's not just a Sarah Michelle Gellar, um, but that doesn't hurt. Um, it doesn't hurt. Certainly. It doesn't hurt. But... <laughs> that is so moral majority. <laughs> That's her first line. It's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I think, like I was saying, I think we can agree that Scream 2 is probably the best. Even though it's not like, I would, it's weird. Like, yes, objectively, Scream is the best, but Scream 2 is my favorite. I think Scream 2 is easily, and I would hope that you would agree with me on this. I think Scream 2 is the most ambitious. Yes. Um, one might argue, although the only one that might argue this would be me, and I'm not going to argue it, that Scream <laughs> 3 is pretty ambitious, but it's ambitious in a different way. Scream 2 is the most ambitious Hollywood horror sequel of its, of its kind, of its time. I mean, uh, there was such a phenomenon surrounding the first film that everyone involved knew that everything about Scream 2 had to be bigger, better, scarier, more cameos, more stars. Um, I mean, the big difference is I think every featured extra in Scream 2 is a celebrity now or was at some point. Whereas in the first Scream, every featured extra is some 40 year old <laughs> actress playing a high schooler in a uh, girl's bathroom so <laughs> that, i know exactly which woman you're referring to too <laughs> and then I'll, uh, no, the scream 2 scene. is just uh scream 2 goes literally just balls to the wall to make everything just that much more extreme and i think it succeeds on pretty yeah. much every level in doing that um, did you see Scream 2 or did you see any of them? I'm, I feel like you must have seen three or so in the trailer or in the theater. But did you see two in the theater? 
Uh, I saw all of them in the theater, except I honestly cannot remember if I saw the original in the theater. I remember it was definitely one that I watched on VHS a lot. I had the VHS from Blockbuster. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but other than that, I've seen the rest of them theatrically, certainly. I remember seeing two opening weekend and uh, the vibe in the movie theater was very much like the vibe in the opening scene, they weren't handing out costumes, <laughs> but everybody was real excited. Everybody was really, really excited to see the new screen. Oh yeah. No, um, was, yeah. And I know you remember this, we've talked about it, uh, but there was that iconic Entertainment Weekly cover with the women of Scream, Tori Spelling being one of them. It yes. was like Tori Spelling and Jada Pinkett, Sarah Michelle Gellar and Nev Campbell, if memory serves. Um, I believe so, yes. Um, not also, the poor actress that played Hallie. <laughs> um, I remember there was even a contest uh, on MTV to get into, like, I have a walk on roll in Scream 2. Wow. And uh, the one, the winner of the contest is the one that notifies Sydney, like, at the very beginning, like, turn on the news. Like, she comes into the dorm room. Um, sh- that, that woman. Oh, okay. Won- oh, Fun. She won that that walk on role on MTV. Wow! So that's cool. Good for her. Yeah. Turn on the news. Turn on the news. <laughs> she was uh, so also, good at it. I didn't even <laughs> notice. I know. I was so ready to just like hurry up, turn on the news, Sydney. You have to know what's going on. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I just yeah. I love these movies. Um, I'm trying to really find as we're even talking like a through line and what to talk about, and I kind of just. I keep thinking of things that I love about it and I could easily just make this a list of things that I like. Um, (laughs) I mean, it's my podcast, so it kind of already is that anyway, let's face it. Um, Well, I mean, if you, I mean, the through line, I think the one of, one of the easiest ones is the killers and their relation to Sydney. Yeah. uh, Yeah. Yeah. Figurative and familial. Yeah. um, Because I think that kind of informs a lot of, the story uh you know sort of retroactively um scream 2 is it's scream 2's the killers in scream 2 are uh kind of left field and a little bit a little bit out there but that's part of sort of what i mentioned about scream 2 just being that much more ambitious and crazy um is that it's two characters one that you probably would have guessed and another that you probably didn't guess i didn't guess that laurie metcalf was going to be one of the killers um but i certainly had my eye on timothy oliphant for a number of reasons (laughs) i remember that's another thing about about scream 2 that i wanted to bring up is that i remember um seeing that in the theater opening weekend he takes the mask off and people in, in the theater myself included were like who is that because he doesn't make much of an impression especially the first oh, time really? through yeah yeah um oh, I, didn't, I, I mean i don't know i i mickey is kind of throughout that entire movie i mean he's always there so i don't know but he barely like he just doesn't make any kind of an impression. Like he has a line here and a line there and he's got the camera. Um, and it, I didn't remember him the first time watching it. Like now, obviously having, watching it now, knowing who it is, I spot him and I'm like, okay, there he is. And he's got the camera. So of course that all plays into the thing later when they are going through the footage. Um, but I remember just sort of being like, what? Who was that? And I, uh, another interesting, like I said, I tried to kind of forget everything I knew. Um, and one of the things about Scream 2 that I always forget is there's kind of a beat when uh, Gail walks out where it lets the audience oh, yeah. think, where it lets the audience think that she's behind it. Yes. And right up until uh, Sydney says it, she's like, Gail? And then she shakes her head no. And then out comes. Um, I mean, Lori, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good misdirect, but. Yeah, it also wouldn't have made any sense if it had been Gail. So it's no, kind of, no. I mean, thank God it was only a beat and not any longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just one of those things that when I've I've seen it enough that I, like I said, rewatching it this time, I I guess I just hadn't noticed it since or in a while. I was like, oh yeah, they kind of like give you a minute to think that, but mm-hmm. um, 
And then of course, three, the identity in three is uh, Felicity's Noel. <laughs> um roman bridger how dare you (laughs) (laughs) he will always be noel to me i'm sorry uh he has a new show on abc or some channel and i've seen commercials for it and i'm always like oh no noel's back on tv (laughs) um roman bridger yeah so the whole premise of the movie the whole premise of the original trilogy anyway is that maureen prescott is a slut (laughs) yeah. <laughs> and all of the men in her life hate her for it and um and i noticed in rewatching it that the original three killers everybody with the exception of mickey refers to sydney's mom as a slut or yeah. calls her that in some way no that really um, is like maureen prescott's defining characteristic yeah not even you, that she's dead it's mostly that she's a <laughs> slut and also that she's dead <laughs> yeah yeah you know well, I, I will mean, say though um the one She's of the only characters that really comes to her defense is Tatum in the original. Um, in talking to Sid, she's the only one who says maybe her mom was just a really unhappy woman. Yeah. And that is like the only kind of sympathy that this character is given. Um, interesting that it only happens in the first movie <laughs> and everyone else just wants to drag her for being a slut. Yeah, until she's a ghost in three. <laughs> she's not really a ghost. Come on. She's a... Uh, uh, um... She's a hallucination. Okay, fair. <laughs> she's an isolation-based hallucination. <laughs> also a bad dream. One of them was a dream, right? She was yeah. asleep. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting to note, though, all of that, because uh, uh, Kevin Williamson is gay. And uh, obviously he's still kind of trafficking in some of those like horror film tropes of like, you know, the, the virgin horror complex kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, um, it's all stuff that, you know, when I was 16, I didn't notice that. I didn't give it any thought, but um, um, you mentioned Rose McGowan. And yes. I really think uh, if we're talking these movies, we got to talk about the cast. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, just across the four, even um of course, Sarah Michelle Geller, like we mentioned, Rose McGowan, um, David Arquette, Courtney Cox, um, Skeet Ulrich, uh, Matthew Willard, Jenny McCarthy, Parker Posey, Patrick Dempsey, um, Jay and Silent Bob. These are my screen three notes. <laughs> um, Sarah Michelle Geller, Joshua Jackson shows up for a second um, in screen two. Jada Pinkett Smith shows up for a second. Omar Epps. Um, I could keep going. Um, all of these, I, the second one on in particular, were very much like, I feel like every agent in Hollywood was like, get let's get our actors in this screen yep. movie. And that's exactly what they did. And then if they couldn't do it, then they were in at Urban Legends. <laughs> or they were Rebecca Gayhart, who was in both. Rebecca Gayhart, oh, Portia de Rossi. Happen. Yeah. Uh, Speaking of, like you said, those even the bit players uh, have gone on to have careers. Yes. Uh, Joshua Jackson and Portia de Rossi. And, um, well, Joshua Jackson was already a household name because of Dawson's Creek. Yeah, yeah. And isn't there a line? Um, I didn't watch Party of Five, but isn't uh, Sober Sister C.C. Cooper when she's on the phone? Isn't she talking about Party of Five on the phone? She is, yes. Yes. Yeah. So who plays Haley? I think yeah. Uh, who plays her in the Scream verse? And one of my notes is too, too is who plays Monica in the friend in the in the Scream verse? Who plays Monica? Uh, because David Schwimmer and Jennifer Aniston are established names, but you know um, they don't ever say friends, right? But like, of course that's what that's what it is, you know. And then of course Allison Brie in four when she comes up to Courtney Cox and is like, "You are my '90s." Mm. and <laughs> all of us who grew up watching them was like yes yes you are but also so was nev campbell and and do like so is the, this cast in its way that 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 trio as much as courtney cox in friends as part of my 90s so were uh david arquette and nev sure campbell from these movies um because they were everywhere yeah um but yeah let's talk about the overarching story like we were saying it's uh uh, 
she's a slut, Maureen Prescott, and and is the reason Maureen's for. Slut, <laughs> let's see what happens. That's basically yeah. the mission yeah. for this, this entire franchise. <laughs> she breaks up uh, Billy Loomis's family, and so right. Billy Loomis and his buddy Stu get revenge, mm-hmm. motivated by Roman, who doesn't show up until later. Yes. And then that pisses off Billy's mom. So then Billy's mom goes crazy and tries to kill her. Um, unrelated to Roman. So Roman didn't have anything to do with two. Correct. And then yes. th- and then three, of course, he's the killer in three. And that's when you that's when the all bets are off, because it's the it's the trilogy, because all bets are off. Um, <laughs> Patrick Dempsey. Patrick Dempsey. <laughs> I mean, he's just a, a child in that in Scream 3, it's really, I was so almost put off by how young he was. Uh, And then they partner him with just that annoying character actor who's really nasally. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) It's just really unfortunate that that was his partner. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that guy feels like a sort of a sitcom character. Yeah. Uh, he feels really out of place. And I, I don't want to start piling on Scream 3, but I, <laughs> I'm going to at some point. Um, that's one of the many things about it that don't work for me, is that it is the comedy is so much more broad. Um, and he feels like a, star, a, a cartoon or a sitcom character. Um, and it feels more like a movie ripping off Scream than a Scream movie. Um, and the fact that Kevin Williamson wrote an outline that was then discarded to me only underlines that point. <laughs> well, I mean, I I can certainly give you that part about his outline being discarded and that being concerning. Um, but I think Scream 3 is tied so much to the stab films, the fictional stab films that are in universe. And I think it is more cartoonish. The world is more cartoonish because the movie is kind of split between two worlds. It's you have like the stab verse and you have the real world. And obviously a lot of what that movie tries to have fun with is the blurred lines between those two worlds. Um, But it is, it's trying to say a lot about Hollywood about the nature of celebrity. Uh, I mean, just I mean, pick a pick a trope about Hollywood. It's probably trying to say something about it. Um, not always with success, I will admit. I love Scream Three, as Brian pointed out. Uh, I am the lone defender. It feels like sometimes uh, of Scream Three. I think that there's a lot to love, even though it is completely ridiculous. Um, but well, can I segue into my Scream Three? Not versus Scream Four, but Absolutely, Scream yeah. Three. So, in watching very recently Three and Four almost back to back, what struck me as standing out about Four and not in a good way has to do with the idea of family and specifically Sid's family uh, in Scream Three we learn that she has this sort of half brother uh, and it's shocking because the first three films really paint a picture of it being Sid and her dad sort of against the world. They only have each other. There is no one else. Like they just, they have each other. That's it. Um, They depend on each other so much. And so the reveal of a half brother throws so many, I guess, so, so, so many wrenches into Sid's idea of who her family is. Um, but then Scream 4 opens with Sydney visiting her aunt <laughs> and her cousin and it just feels like oh so she's now suddenly had weird extended family this whole time that literally live in woodsboro literally her aunt that she visits is in woodsboro 
uh, it just feels like it's a little bit of a cop out to suddenly just give her, you know, a whole other branch of a family tree that was not in any way alluded to in the first three films. It's about her being a survivor. It's about her being alone. I mean, that is like the big thing is like flashing in neon lights. Sydney is alone until she isn't. And that was what was a little bit hard to swallow about four because that is kind of like a very big conceit of four. You kind of have to swallow that pill that she has this family that she's visiting because it sets up literally everything else in the movie. Um, it didn't feel genuine to me as much as I love Mary McDonald forever. Uh, so she say we all. didn't belong there. So <laughs> say we all. Uh yeah, I couldn't buy into that huge piece of the puzzle. Although I will say Scream 4 played much better for me on this rewatch. I really did try to go in, as you said, with fresh eyes. And uh, and I tried and I enjoyed it more than I did the first two times that I watched it. Uh, but that was one of the main things that I'm like, oh, wait, there maybe there is a reason I don't like this movie. And that was part of it was I think it's just it's a it's hard to suspend my disbelief that much when it comes to Sydney's family, because it is the through line of this entire franchise is her family. Yeah, I get that. Um, that just I guess that just never bothered me. I don't know. Um, and even now, um, it doesn't bother me. Um, well, I mean, cause like her cousin is so much younger than her. So, um, I mean, I guess their ages aren't really ever established. Um, or certainly the, I should say that the, uh, I guess her, her aunt's age is never really established, but we can kind yes. of roughly yeah. know how old Mary, Mary McDonald is, um, and sort of extrapolate, but, um, I would all, all I, I guess I would find it easy to believe that if she had a small child running around that she would that they would not be a non-factor when being you know uh, stalked by a murderer. <laughs> you know he's not they're not she's not going to go and like let's hide at my aunt's place with the baby. Um, again, that's I that's you and I talking about it right now. I promise you, we're giving it more thought than Kevin Williamson and Wes Craven did. <laughs> they were honestly probably just like uh she's back in woodsboro and uh i don't know and and maybe um, oh and they're not really back in woodsboro and that's the other thing that bugs the h e you can say it out of me uh i really really just fucking hate that it's not filmed in northern california because it doesn't look like northern california it looks like georgia <laughs> it just looks like Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> um, and don't don't make a big deal about going back to Woodsboro if you're not going to take me back to Woodsboro. Sorry. That's fair. I'll give you that. I, I like the return to, although I agree, it doesn't look like the same town at all. Um, I do like the return home and that aspect of it. And I like Jill Roberts. I like the idea of uh, her kind of growing up in the shadow of Sydney and really just kind of like being kind of like spoiled and jealous that like, oh, Sydney's like, look at how famous Sydney is. And all she had to do was not get killed. Like, um, and it, one of, it does have one of my favorite uh, lines from any of the killers in Scream, which is what was I supposed to do? Go to college, get a job. <laughs> um, you know, I can, I, I get that, that, I mean, I've been that age. We all have. Um, and I get the sentiment of like, really, I'm supposed to get a job. Um, obviously, I, I didn't go around killing people to avoid it, but um, I like I like that aspect of it. Um, I agree that the um, it is a little out of left field, the family there. Um, but I like, like I said, I like the motivation of of Jill and her character a lot. So I guess I for, forgave it that because. Um, that worked for me at the end. I guess I uh, I don't hate her as the killer, but I don't love her either. And honestly, it's the other one too, the other Culkin. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> the two of them, I was just like, oh wow, I, this is. It's just there was no for me. There was no heartbeat to it. It just kind of laid there. 
um, as reveals go, certainly yeah. in these movies, when that when those reveals happen, I was just kind of like, oh, okay, yeah, like there it is. There, it's the weird movie kid, the other Culkin, and <laughs> the Culkin Emma Roberts Rick. playing a character named Jill Roberts. Okay, yes. Well, that was um, that is questionable. I I have to wonder why they did that, but. Um... It does. I don't know. It, that didn't bother me. It doesn't bother me nearly as much as the two characters in Scream Three that are named after Angelina Jolie. Um, <laughs> uh, and then there was one named after. I don't want to like pivot back to that, but um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll we'll get to that in a minute. But um, I don't know. I liked I like Scream Four. I like like I said the fact that it's like her niece slash an aunt. I can that I can see that being out of left field, but I like that sort of. I guess is it. Is it Gen Z? I don't even know. Mm. She's too young to be a millennial. But just that, to me, it's kind of just mocking that age group and that mentality. And that, and I guess, like I said, I think that worked for me. Well, the humor is very much making fun of a, a millennial before people were really talking about millennials. But it's, yeah. it's like almost word for word, the same kind of jokes that you can crack about millennials. So yeah. it yeah. was ahead of its time, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. And also uh, your favorite character, Kirby. Kirby, Hayden Panettiere. Um, I have to say I enjoyed her more this time around. And I realized like almost immediately why. It's because she is written 110% like a gay man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She is she is a gay man that just yeah. happened to be played by Hayden Panettiere. Um, and yeah, it works. It works for the most part. I wish that she was a gay man instead yeah. of the gay that we got at the <laughs> very end. Yeah. Which was just a very, I'm sorry, this is a queer film podcast, so I think we need to discuss this. Uh, what are you doing, Kevin Williamson? This is the gay character you want to give us? This one? The one that just died? Like, really? I actually... Watching it this time, I had the thought, like, is he gay or is he just trying to get this person to stop trying to kill him? Like, he, I don't know. Even... I know. Because no. earlier, isn't he in the earlier in the thing? He's like, I'm about to get lucky with a girl. I can't tell my exact coordinates. Um, and obviously, gay men throughout time have slept with girls before, you know, they, you know, realized they were gay or before they came out. So that's not that unusual, but uh, it was just a thought that occurred to me watching it this time was that. Maybe he's just saying it. But you're right. There is no... There's no representation in these movies. None, at none whatsoever. Except for uh, one of her bodyguards in Scream 2. <laughs> don't ask, yeah. don't tell. Strangely, I will say, I have to amend my previous statement because both of those, uh, her security detail are just the most nondescript, generic white guys. I There's just... I don't think they're anyone. Maybe they're the same actor. I don't know. <laughs> they could be. We would we would never know. No. Uh, so they're the exception. They're the only non-famouses in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> Famouses. I love it. Uh, no, even uh, Liev Schreiber, Cotton Weary himself, has a TV show. Um, yeah. One hundred percent cotton. <laughs> I love that it's called one hundred percent cotton. That makes me really happy. <laughs> I read in the Internet Movie Database trivia that in the opening scene of Scream 3, he insisted on taking off his jacket because he had been working out a lot. It showed. He yeah. looked fantastic. As soon as yeah. he took that jacket off, I was like, damn. Yeah. <laughs> but he was... It was... In 1999. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, he's not... A, he's, he looks pretty good in this movie. Um Another thing about, and I, again, I don't want to pile on it too much, but we are on screen three. Um, the, the, it's the one and only time the killer uses not just like the Roger Jackson fake voice, but like pretends to be other people fake voice. Oh yeah, no, we definitely have to have a, a whole, there's a whole, there's a whole conversation to be had about cloned cell phones yeah. and how voice recorder technology works. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, I've, I've seen the memes and everything and a lot of people are openly wondering why in Scream 5 are they even answering the phone? <laughs> because 
When was the last time someone called you from a no- number you didn't recognize and you answered? Well, yeah, that's that's definitely fair. Um, yeah, but yeah. no, in this trailer for Scream Five, isn't the opening girl answering her landline? Yeah, there's a landline, and then yeah, she has a text exchange, and he's like, "How did you know my landline is ringing?" With Amber, whoever she is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then it's like, why do you have a landline? Well, <laughs> Who has a land? We'll have landlines. It yeah. is Woodsboro. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Um, I do like in that. Uh, not to again jump all over, but like in the Scream not Scream 5 trailer. That's I think that's what I'm going to call. It. I'm just going to call it not Scream 5. It's but fine. when she <laughs> when she's like, I'm Sydney Prescott, of course I've got it done. Like, yeah, Sydney Prescott would have it done at this point. Honestly, after the events of the first movie, Sydney would have it done, I feel well, like. Yeah, and she was also like a crazy survivalist in 3, so obviously oh, she yeah. Win. yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, allegedly that trailer is filled with Mr. X. Um, which Get is out. A screen filled with Mr. X? Right? I mean, um, there really weren't that many directs for them to misdirect. I didn't. Yeah, know. there's not a lot of information uh, gleaned in that. Although I did, I remember seeing uh, Gale was running in slow motion and screaming, and I was like, no. I, I'm very protective of, of these characters, and I don't want them to die. Um, but I think in, I think, well, they say in four, they're like, oh, none of the original is are safe. Um, yeah. Oh, well, that's three, actually. That's Randy in three. He's like, they Randy says that in his video. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, yeah, because this is all, a, the fourth is all a reboot. So that's right. I was mixing up my sequel. Oh, yeah, there. the fourth is all about reboots. The third one's about trilogies. Yeah. The fifth one is about calling it the same thing as the first movie. <laughs> Uh, to go, let's go back to the first movie because I did. I just saw a question in my notes that I wanted to ask you. So you don't remember if you saw it in the theater. Um, I remember um, when, like I said, I came back from Christmas break and uh, everybody at my high school was like talking about it and everybody was into it. But I remember, as always happens, you're going to get those like dude bros that are just like. Um, I just, I remember people being like, "Oh, it's so stupid." I know he, I knew that Billy and Stu were the killer, like right from that fountain scene. And for me, watching it the first time, I wasn't l- expecting them to be the killers, so I wasn't looking for that. So yeah. my question, I guess, is: Were is do you remember the? I guess if you don't remember seeing it in the theater, you don't. Maybe you don't remember. But do you remember like trying to figure it out, or was it all a surprise? Because for me, I think I kind of went in, and about half hour in, I was like, "Oh, it's her dad." Um, and I wasn't I, looking for anything. I definitely else. didn't. I wasn't trying to figure it out. I think, especially because it was something of a novelty. It was something so new. I and I, I was also still young, and I wasn't at a point where I was really watching things with a critical eye either. Right. Um. So for me, it was something that was just really fun and really different. But I wasn't like, I certainly wasn't trying to figure it out while I was sitting there watching it for the first time, even though I don't remember the first time I saw it, I can definitely tell you, I wasn't trying to figure it out. It was just me just letting it all happen and just being obsessed. Yeah. That tends to be how I, I I try to watch movies the first time is just not trying to be like ahead of, not trying to think ahead of the movie. I mean, obviously some movies are really poorly made and you can, you're, you're ahead of it, whether you want to be or not. Um, but I would actually say in all of the screen movies, obviously in two and three and four, you're sort of, you have that expectation. So you're like, okay, which one is it? And you're looking for, you're looking for clues. Um, but maybe I'm just a bad mystery solver because in each case I was surprised. Oh yeah. The no, they do a good job. I mean, like you said, there's always Mr. X. Um, they will always try to throw you off the scent. And that's part of the fun. I think, yeah. I guess I think part of the fun is uh they always throw enough suspects at the audience that if you are a person who is trying to sit in the theater and figure it out, you might be able to. But also if you are the opposite and you just want to like watch it and let it happen, all those all those extra suspects just make it more fun. So yeah. it kind of works either way. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I just remember being annoyed with people. They were like, I figured it out at the at the fountain scene. And it's like- I think people we, will like, be saying that about about- every movie i mean right and night shyamalan 
yeah remember the the backlash of everyone in the world claiming that they knew about the sixth sense the whole time yeah like, dang you didn't right <laughs> Yeah, that just always bugged me. Um, but I like that was just another thing I was thinking about because I was, like I said, trying to kind of watch it with fresh eyes. I found myself wondering, like, trying to remember. I, like I said, when I saw it, I was definitely not. Like I said, I feel like I got about half hour into the movie and I was like, it's her dad. It's obviously her dad. And I kind of had stopped thinking about it. And then it, suddenly it wasn't. And so, yeah. Um, yeah. But of course now, yeah, we go into these movies now already, like, Who's it going to be? Who do you think it's going to be? Yeah. Um, and we've already had, you and I have already had a text exchange of like, which of the, which of these characters are they going to kill off? Yeah. Um, I hope they don't, but I'm sure they might. I don't know. I think it's going to be Dewey and it'll be Gail and Sydney BFFs forever. Yeah. I love that though. I love that for them. Um, another thing that I was kind of noticing rewatching at this time, or something that I noticed is, uh, like, in the beginning, basically by the end of two, uh, Gail is confirmed friends with everybody. Um, but it, obviously at the beginning, they're like, oh, be kind, she saved our lives. Like, But they're kind of watching her from afar, because there's still this kind of animosity with her. And yeah. I was watching it, I was like, the moment like she becomes friends with them is after they leave the... Uh, I guess it's like the precinct and it's when it's when Courtney Cox says uh, I just want to I just want to catch this fucker like that's when she's finally on board as like now she's helping Dewey and I don't know it just feels not like helping that's... Dewey. she's not helping Dewey she's helping Detective Kincaid in three I'm talking about in two when she leaves the they she leaves with Dewey she's wearing that like white white top uh, without without the jacket the jacket comes later um but they've just been talking about like marine and uh phil stevens all on the dc cooper (laughs) yeah sober sister yes um um no i just like i said watch trying to kind of watch it with fresh eyes i was like just watching that scene i was like okay i feel like this is when gail really starts to kind of uh, turn the tide of being more an ally to them and now at this and now at this point i feel like by the time of like scream five i mean you see, even see in the trailer they like look at each other and she's like are you ready and she's like no never like now like in a way i almost feel like if if these were real people the only other people in the world that they could trust would be like if it's if it's sydney it's like dewey and gail and everyone else is a suspect <laughs> you know yeah. um and I, I could kind of see that being this sort of uh, weird, diabolical, twisted kind of bond amongst friends, amongst them as friends. Um, yeah. But at the same time, it's like, what do they, do you think they like go to dinner? <laughs> when, like, I mean, probably. They have I guess, to, yeah. Well. Um, I will say in rewatching all of them, the whole like, Oh, it's like tough being friends with Sydney. When you're friends with Sydney, you die. And yes, that is true. Um, but the, the the whole franchise does a really good job of not like blaming it on Sydney. Like it, yeah. I mean, it's not her fault that all this crazy shit happens. It's her slutty um, mom's fault. <laughs> slutty mom's fault, first of all. However, my point is uh, in rewatching them, there is one death that is 100% on Sydney. It is her fault. I hope she still is going to therapy about it. And I hope that she brings it up in Scrifheim because <laughs> she killed her roommate Hallie in Scream 2. Yeah. They were out of the car, they were at a safe distance. They both could have gotten away, and Sydney was so obsessed with finding out who was underneath the mask that she left her friend alone <laughs> and went back to figure it out, and of course didn't. And of course, Hallie then gets viciously murdered, and that is a thousand percent on Sydney. And I hope she feels real bad about that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope she does too, but I I doubt it. I doubt it. I that was one of the things I always wondered about that is like how do you climb all the way out of that car in that situation and not 
take the mask Rip off. Rip the mask your- off on the way out. <laughs> right. Right. Like, just take the mask off, girl. Like, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make any sense. But uh, that whole escape from the car scene is genius. It the the tension is amazing. It's an excellent scene. Uh, but damn Sydney, she just wanted to help you. Yeah. Yeah. Poor Sydney. Um, another name that has not come up uh in our discussion yet that I know needs to Parker Posey. Oh yes. As, oh, yes Jennifer. <laughs> uh Parker Posey for me is what makes three watchable um as i've mentioned i'm not a fan of the film but i love every scene that she's in um and i think she absolutely elevates the movie um for sure she makes it so much more enjoyable and watchable such a fantastic uh she's the comic relief in a movie that's already stuffed with comedy and that's pretty impressive (laughs) well in my mind she's the only comedy that works like her character is the only like a lot of the jokes um a lot of my issue of the issues that i have too with scream 3 or like that those a lot of the jokes don't work like the connie chung thing doesn't work um why doesn't it work it's a funny joke where they think she's a different news correspondent i don't understand how that's not just a very easy joke because that work to you they think she's another black-haired news lady because in, you hate them. That's all. I hate it's not them. that the joke doesn't work. You just hate them. I do hate them. <laughs> uh, one of the other, one of the many notes that I have was that, but the the scene where they're like this, this the the script is being fax printed in three, and they keep running back and forth. Like that scene is stupid. I've always oh, thought yeah, that it's, super dumb. it's so stupid. It's not super scary, dumb. and then it blows up, and it's like okay. And it kills it. Matt, Matt Keesler, is that his name? Mm-hmm. Is that the actor? Yeah. From Psycho Beach Party. Poor guy. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just one of the many things that don't work for me um, in that movie. Of which, like I said, I think there's a lot. But I don't think any of it's scary. Like, I don't know. The scene I think which- when they finally get to the mansion party at the end, it's scary because at least they have a scary setting to work with yeah um i think they did the return to woodsboro thing better than scream 4 did because at least theirs was on a movie set and it looked like it (laughs) um but now i just it's but also the new the new scream five cream (laughs) is going back to woodsboro but like you can clearly see in the trailer like the sets, like the houses, the stained glass window of Stu's house. Um, you can see that they're like recreating these locations again. And I just feel like, well, Scream 3 already did that. So <laughs> maybe don't make such a big deal about it. <laughs> uh, one of the conversations that you and I have had about these movies um, is I always, well, you, for you, Scream 4 is not canon. And for me, Scream 3 is not canon. Um, and so whenever they're like going back to Woodsboro again, it's like, oh, that's because three didn't happen. <laughs> I mean, well, the thing is, it's actually pretty easy to excise both of them from yeah. canon. Sure. Uh, I mean, yeah. The exception of Marley Shelton insisting on being in five cream, which <laughs> makes it so much harder to disregard Scream 4. Um but you can kind of take both of them out and it probably all still works. I mean, yeah. they are never going to talk about the events of Scream 3 again and they're probably not going to talk about the events of Scream 4 again. Yeah. It sounds like they're really only concerned with the original. Um, and that's fine for, you know, for 25 years later, that's fine. Oh, David Putty. David Putty is in 3. Wait, who's it's that? Not- uh, the, the, the security guard uh, from he was on Seinfeld. His character's name is on, is on Seinfeld as David Putty. I don't remember his name. He's uh, Parker Posey's like bodyguard. Wait, oh Patrick Warburton? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I didn't remember his name. I just I, I oh. <laughs> he is was and always will just be David Putty to me from Seinfeld. Oh, 
Uh, well, he's Kronk too from the Emperor's New Groove. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but since we're on three, another like we were talking about the scary scene, quote unquote scary scenes. The scene with Jenny McCarthy is another one that b- bugs me. I like the shot of like all the ghost masks and like one of them being a real person. Um, but it works much better as a publicity still, which they used it for. Yeah, and it was great. It's like having you know a room full of mirrors and you don't know which one's the real thing. Yeah, it's- which they also do later. Three, three does later with Parker Posey and the, or I guess they're not mirrors, are they? No, but no, there's not multiple ghost faces though. Yeah, that's true. In that, that's true. Um, I think the being behind the mirror is in the multi-paneled mirror was actually a very inventive scene. But uh, I love the in two when uh, they're in those soundproof rooms and they're like hitting the glass and they can't hear the other side. Um, that's always been one of my favorite moments in the movie, like that little scene. Yeah. Uh, but I, just to talk about Jenny McCarthy again, and this is just a drag on Jenny McCarthy because fuck her. <laughs> but when she well, says she wasn't terrible at that at that point, I mean, she probably was, but we didn't know she was that terrible yet. Remember when I it was, was so fun to see Jenny McCarthy? That there was a time when it was fun to see her. Was there? Yeah. She was always just annoying, though. Well. I mean, I'm not t- not talking about like New Year's Eve celebrations or anything, but um, no. But her line when she's talking about the shower scene in Vertigo. Uh, and Vertigo, my w- the one thing I sort of have always thought about that. I'm like, I don't think that Jenny McCarthy knows there's a joke there. I don't think that she knows. She does. I don't think that she doesn't seem. Oh like my she god! <laughs> if she does, it's because. She was in Scream 3 and someone explained it to her. I said, wow, you really hate Jenny McCarthy. I'm not her fan or anything, but wow. <laughs> yeah, I just, I, uh, she really drags the movie down for me too. That's another thing. That's like, like, you, what's that, that, that like nasally, in addition to like having like jokes that don't land and things like that, it has like actors that I don't like and characters that I don't like, <laughs> which is like stacked against it. Like, I don't like Jane Simon Bob. I don't like Jenny McCarthy. Lance Henriks though. Henriksen. Lance Henriksen is great, though. Uh, standing next to a fake Terminator. Um, but I also, speaking of Lance Henriksen, how about, you're talking about, like, things at skewering in Hollywood. This is a movie produced by the Weinsteins featuring a sexual predator as a head of a movie studio. Yep. <laughs> and uh, I, um, another cast member, again, hopping all over the the quadrology if you will henry winkler <laughs> what henry winkler oh yes um i i spotted for the first time i don't know if you ever noticed in scream 4 that there is a scene where they're in uh woodsboro high and they're by the lockers and they cut away very quickly but there is a bust of principal Hembry, and that makes me feel very happy i, I was- didn't notice it but i that's another trivia bit on the internet movie database. Oh, is and, it? Oh, yeah. that's funny. No, I noticed it for the first time. I was like, what's that giant bronze bust? Oh, it's Principal Hembry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it, I, I didn't notice it on my own. I looked for it because I had read that. So I did, I did see it. Fair I don't enough. know that I would have noticed it on my own. It caught me by surprise and that was a fun surprise, I will say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it makes sense. You know, he was murdered and hung up on the football on the football field uh life at woodsboro <laughs> life in woodsboro <laughs> uh, another thing that i kind of occurred to me watching this uh given certainly uh the current era's uh love of of prequel prequelitis is how long do you think before we get like a tv show about maureen prescott in hollywood like oh my God. <laughs> Let me write it. Are you kidding? <laughs> um, <Love> Aaron Kruger. <laughs> uh, I that would be fun. I I, I fear they would they would uh, take it back to Woodsboro, and you'd have like a young Sydney and a young Billy, and a lot of like winky like lines of dialogue, and a young sexy Tatum, but she's yeah. seven or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just something stupid like that. Um, um, uh, did you ever watch the Scream TV series, either incarnations? Um, I watched a couple of episodes of a couple of different incarnations, but I never watched an entire season. Yeah, what I watched all of 
I did watch all of the the first. I oh, it's going to be punny. I was going to say the first stab <laughs> that they took at it, <laughs> unintentional. Uh, but the the first one is. It, I mean, neither are great from what I understand. But I didn't watch the second one, which is the one that Queen Latifah executive produced. Okay. Uh, but the the first one is a pretty good slasher story that feels very much in the spirit of Scream, but it's just wholly unrelated. So it yeah. just feels difficult to give it that name. Right. Um, like it's a pretty good like teen horror series that like kept me guessing a lot of the time, but it just feels a little bit of a cop out to call it Scream if right. it's not even the ghost face mask if it's not the voice if it's you know yeah i didn't like that mask that they were using oh it was weird yeah but there was was there not correct me if i'm wrong was there not a season where they like brought back ghostface that's the queen latifah series that's the one with paris jackson right yes i believe so yeah i think i watched i didn't see any of that i watched the first episode i think and i guess i didn't like it enough to watch it anymore yeah, I mean, it wasn't very memorable. Um, but I also think I was really watching it more out of just sort of a morbid curiosity. I don't think I ever, sure. I don't even think I ever really was like, oh, I'm going to watch this whole thing. I'm just like, I have to see it. I have to know. It was more like that. Um, but yeah, it is on Netflix. You know, it's Halloween season. So maybe. It's there, yeah. <laughs> um, anything else about these four films you wanted to, to bring up? I do you think it, it's, worth bringing up we're talking about kevin williamson uh and just i think it's worth just sort of discussing his work in the 90s and like i said you know i know you did last summer you mentioned um and how that was basically produced hot on the heels of the success of scream but then it just kind of feels like the kind of movie that scream was making fun of um so he obviously did like sort of a generic flat version of it and that was i know you did last summer yeah. And then had had fun with it with Scream. Yeah, that checks out. And of course, Halloween H2O, like we mentioned. I guess we weren't recording when we talked about that, but uh, he produced that and was responsible yes. for that. Um, yeah. One of my favorite entries in the Halloween franchise that they yeah. keep trying to sweep under the rug, but I won't let them. <laughs> Justice for Josh Hartnett. And, uh, exactly. <laughs> Hashtag restore the timeline. Uh, Gail Weathers hair. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, I will say I was kind of disappointed because while her hair in four is better than the bangs in three, it just it's just like a regular haircut in four. Four is more about that bang and body of hers because she looks insane in the fourth one she her body is fantastic she's wearing those like slinky little mini dresses and everything looking yeah looking great the bangs we all hate love love to hate the bangs even courtney cox posted that uh i think it was one of her first instagram posts was making fun of the bangs and i appreciate that yeah um David Arquette has since taken full responsibility. Did he um, do it? <laughs> it was his idea. He wanted, he was he he suggested a cut like Betty Page in his words. Well, there's a cut like Betty Page and there's what happened in Scream 3 <laughs> and they are two very different things. I I uh my prediction for Gail for uh not Scream 5 is that she has a podcast now. Probably. Yep. It's the Gail Weathers podcast. Uh, that's how she's uh, keeping her. That's I think, and I think they're divorced. I I don't know if I th- almost feel like that goes without saying. Dewey and and Gail would be divorced. Oh, that makes it even more annoying that Marley Shelton is there because she's obsessed with Dewey. <laughs> well, she's like the sheriff. She's she was the deputy, and now she's the sheriff because Dewey probably, probably left. I guess, yeah. As you know, she is not the actress I would have brought back from four. Hashtag justice for Kirby. <laughs> Kirby. Um, now I will say yes. I wish that she had lived because she is the better character. But yeah, you know what can you do? Yeah, yeah, she's probably the best character. She's definitely the best character to come out of that movie. I think. 
have you ever noticed the that Tatum is wearing a uh, uh, outfit what appears to be loosely based on uh, Johnny Depp's outfit from Nightmare on Elm Street with like the midriff. Uh, oh, that's interesting. They're it's like they're I think they're both double zeros, um, huh. and they're like midriffs, like athletic uh, tops. Yeah, the double zeros actually. Yeah, that that checks out. Yes. Yeah. Well, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, of course, and of course, Fred, the Fred. janitor. The janitor. Call me. I do love little things like that. And uh, when I interviewed, when we were talking with uh, Mark Patton about uh, his documentary, Screen Queen, um, It Chapter Two was coming out. And he pointed out that Bill Hader's character wears a button down shirt um, that is nearly identical to one that Jesse wears in Nightmare Two. Oh, that's cool. We haven't talked about Laurie Metcalf. Uh, Aunt Jackie, uh, I love. I grew up watching Roseanne, uh, Academy Award nominee, Laurie Metcalf, uh, and I love her in this movie, all bug-eyed. Oh, she's great. Yeah. With the short hair. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 Listen, local woman. No, it's, she, very, it's very Midwestern. She has a very so deliberate like, inflection to every line that she delivers, and it's, yeah, it's kind of brilliant. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of a, a I, I, it, she's kind of a white-collar Aunt Jackie, I think. <laughs> Yes. Uh, but I love it. Uh, Debbie Saul doesn't exist. I love it. I love it. I could sit here, honestly, and just fill time just reciting that scene and reciting all of her <laughs> stuff. Uh, uh, what is her, what does she say? She's like, there are only like 48 active serial active killers. Active serial killers. <laughs> Mickey here was quite a find. Definitely one on his way up. Um, yeah, otherwise, unless we want to start just quoting the movie, we can wrap up. <laughs> any predictions, though, uh, for uh, b- before we do a Say Something Gay, any, like, predictions for five for those of those of you who are listening in February of 2022? And... Um, I kind of already said it, but I, I think I think Dewey's probably going to die. Yeah, that makes sense. Dewey does seem like the most likely. I yeah. uh, That's a solid prediction. Uh, mine is just... And maybe it's because I have a podcast, but mine is that Gail Weathers has a podcast. Yeah, it, it's a good one. I feel like that's also very likely. <laughs> <laughs> what else is she doing with her time anyway? Um, yeah, I don't know. So thank you so much for coming on. Um, Amazing. Thank you. Uh, do you have a say something gay about these queer horror films? No, they're not really even that queer, even though they are written by a queer Yeah, I was going to say. Um, really gay about them. I wish there was more queer subtext to them, <laughs> certainly. I think, I think the queer subtext, at least mm. for me, I think I think it, it's not really subtext. It's not subtext, but it's the queerest thing about it is that it's a band of uh, uh, basically sort of like outsiders that get together. Um, it's like those three, like they're like outside. I don't know. It's I'm, like the Golden Girl. I'm really, I'm really they reaching. People. <laughs> <laughs> I was reaching with that one. And I'm gonna yeah, edit that one out too. I don't. Yeah, there's <laughs> not. I think the gayest thing about it, honestly, is just the the strong female characters at its center, uh, Gail and Sydney. Um, and it's and sad. having Jerry O'Connell in your movie at the peak of his sexual prowess that <laughs> helps too. See, I grew up. I stand by me as one of my all time favorites, and he's always just. The, you know, he's he's Vern to me, and I've never I've never been into him because I'm like, no, Rose, it's Vern. watch Scream Two again. That's ev- that's my advice to everyone. Just watch <laughs> <Scream> again. <laughs> I hope that's not a all right. Wait, what's he say? I hope that's an off the cuff remark. And not, <laughs> I don't even remember. I thought I could do it, but yeah, I guess my say something gay would just probably be like Skeet Ulrich in 1996, like you know, kind of greasy, I mean, but kind of greasy, know. but. It worked for me at the time. Um, it's that kind of Johnny Depp in Nightmare on Elm Street vibe. Yeah. Um, which is clearly like so obviously what they were going for. Um, but yeah, no, I love these movies. Uh, I'm so happy that I, I was able to get you on. Uh, yes, I'm so happy to be here for them. Uh, it's really five one years. of my all-time favorite franchises, so it's great to... Great to chat about them anytime. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Any final thoughts? I mean, aside from my previous advice of watch Scream 2 again, 
Uh, I, would I, probably be give Scream Three another chance. That's another like universal blanket statement I can just give. Is give Scream Three another chance? Oh, I no. Not you. I didn't say you, Roby. <laughs> You're never gonna watch that movie again. I hope not. <laughs> I really hope not. Why are there two? There. Why are there two people named after Angelina Jolie? There's an Angelina, and then there's a yeah. somebody Jolie. I don't know if you were aware that Angelina Jolie was a working actress in the 90s and that she was kind of popular and that for a movie skewer in Hollywood, it might be a good idea to include some Angelina Jolie references just to real get the audience all gassed up, you know? Is Sure, one, fine. Have one, have an Angelina. That's fine. You I don't mean, need neither to... of them are anything like Angelina Jolie, so it really doesn't make a difference. To me, it just, it again, uh, this could easily become just a, a me piling on screen three, but it, to me, it is further evidence of just like how lazy the script is. And- Will Roberts. <laughs> um, it's very possible they could have written that character before casting Emma Roberts. Yeah, they also <laughs> could have changed the last name. But they didn't. <laughs> they sure didn't. Um, well, good for Emma Roberts, though. She's she's made a name for herself outside of her, her famous family. So, you know, yeah. I'm, she's got a lot of fans. I saw her once at... She does uh, have a lot of fans. That's, <laughs> what, that's a really nice thing to say about her. She I, does have a I, lot of uh, fans. Uh, uh, I saw her and Evan Peters at a grocery store once when I lived in L.A. But anyway, uh, do you want to hit us with your social media? Oh, yes. Uh, You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Hello, Mr. Joe. It's uh, spelled out. So hello, M-I-S-T-E-R-J-O-E. Excellent. Thank you. You can find the podcast at Piece of Pie Pod on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. I am so Brian Rowe. That's Brian with an I, R-O-W-E on Instagram. And find me on Letterboxd. Give me a follow over there. Joe, thank you again. Uh, this is great awesome. to be here. Thank you. Um, I love these movies. Um, if I hadn't just spent the last four days watching them, I would almost put one on right now. But... Do it all again. <laughs> no, I don't think I have it in me. I don't have it in me. Um, oh, but I, I am going to, I, at some point this week, I want to look for the nobody in here but us chickens line that you mentioned. <laughs> ah, yes. I I'll send wanna... the info on that. <laughs> I want to, I want to, I want to find that. Uh, For anyone that doesn't know what Brian's talking about, uh, there is a line in the original Scream when uh, the killings are about to happen at Stu's house at the party and everyone is clearing out and uh, Sid is looking for, I believe, Billy. And she screams upstairs and an unseen voice shouts back, there's nobody up here but us chickens. And I always thought that was a really weird and just kind of silly line, but it turns out that there is actually context to it. Um, Not horror context at all, but uh, there's nobody here but us chickens is a Louis Armstrong uh, sort of jazz big bandish standard um, uh, about a party that's winding down and there's nobody here but us chickens. And Obviously, that is something that a teenager in 1996 would say. <laughs> um, and <laughs> I, I just there, but uh, yes, yeah. And you just told me of this uh, within the last couple of weeks since we've been planning this. And this movie is, as we've discussed, 25 years old. I've seen it dozens of times. I have. There's always something new. <laughs> I know. I have completely missed that line. So. Uh, I'm going to go and look for that. And uh, everybody out there, go get vaccinated and have a safe and happy Halloween.